Hello, hello everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to get started in just a second. All right, we are going live on Facebook. All righty. All right. Welcome, everyone. We've got a few more people kind of making their way in. And we are so excited to be here. Yay. Ah, this is great. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. First things first, I'm Sarah. Uh, my name is Sarah Keith. I am the director of the Atlanta School of Photography. And I am so excited to be here today with some absolutely amazing individuals to help us learn more about Piedmont Heights and uh, the amazing things that you probably didn't know about things that you've gone past many, many, many times, such as the Round Bank, the trust uh, company Round Bank that we'll talk about a little bit later, and other things that you've probably driven past a billion times but didn't even know that were there. So we're going to talk about uh, Monroe Gardens as well. So um, first, before I even start, huge thanks to the City of Atlanta Neighborhood Planning Unit Committee Impact Grant for helping us make this event possible despite this year and the crazy pandemic and everything that's been going on. Uh, so big, big, big thank you to helping us put this event together. Uh, and let's see, so I'm going to go ahead and start by telling y'all a little bit about Piedmont Heights and what, uh, uh, if you guys are in the neighborhood or maybe you're close to the neighborhood, don't know exactly where it is. So Piedmont Heights, also known as Pi High, uh, is a small triangular neighborhood bordered by Piedmont Avenue, Monroe Drive, and the Atlanta Beltline's Northeast Trail behind Flagler Avenue, plus part of the Armour Otley area. Piedmont Heights was settled in 1822 by William Plaster. This was 15 years before Terminus. So this was even the predecessor to the city of Atlanta. So if you think about the impact that the neighborhood has had, over the years. I'm trying to bring up a map here real quick so y'all can actually see what I'm talking about. So if you we're looking at the map itself, you can see exactly where that Piedmont Heights neighborhood resides. So we've got Morningside over here. It's not Morningside. We've got Sherwood Forest over here, not Sherwood Forest, but just within this little area here in my school, I am literally just over here right now. Yay, hi, uh, <laughs> near the Linbridge Martin Manor neighborhood. So uh, we've got this area that we're talking about today within Piedmont Heights. So I am so excited to also introduce some of our speakers as well. So, um, uh, let me see. I have today the wonderful, let's see if I can get here. We have Stacy Catron, uh, the Cherokee Garden Library Director at the Atlanta History Center. She recently published a book, Seeking Eden, a collection of Georgia's historic gardens. So if you have a green thumb, this is one to pick up for sure, which highlights the importance of historic gardens in Georgia's past, as well as their value and meaning within the 21st century communities. Thank you so much for being here, Stacy. We really appreciate it. Super happy to be here, Sarah. And we have Tom Little, the Director of Historic Preservation at Cerber Barber Choate Hurtline, uh, architects and the founding president of the Georgia chapter of Docomomo, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the documentation and conservation of building sites and neighborhoods of the modern movement. Tom recent, uh, received the Advocacy Award of Excellence in the 2018, uh, in 2018 from Docomomo for his work related to one of the buildings we'll be talking about today, among others in the Atlanta area. So, of course, thank you so much for being here, Tom. 
Thank you. I this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited, yeah. <laughs> and we have David Mitchell, the Executive Director of the Atlanta Preservation Center. David graduated from the School of the Artist in Chicago and studied photography and anthropology. He is fortunate to work with the University of Georgia Special Collections Libraries to expand his collections. He is happily married for 20 years and has a 14-year-old son, a native of Rome, Georgia. He and his family now live in Grant Park. Thanks for being here, David. You were very kind to include me, and I apologize for the duress, the echo, and everything. And over the course of time, we're going to get this all navigated. Meg, per your request, I am doing a video. Normally, I would much rather just be a black screen. So thank you very much. I'm very excited about this and really, really think this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, David. Grab those headphones, and we'll get you back in a little bit later on. Okay. Going to make sure we've got this set up, ready to go. All right. So first stop on our tour, we have uh, Monroe Gardens, which is actually, okay, so one of the places that we kept talking about when we were putting this presentation together and I knew nothing. I was like, I didn't even know that this was a thing. So we had a list and I was like, wait, Monroe Gardens, where? where does this exist? And Stacy and Meg invited me out to go and photograph uh, some of the spots around the Monroe Gardens. And we drove into the Ansley Villa apartment complex. And I'm sitting there on my phone going, am I in the right place? Like, am I around? I'm looking around <laughs> and I see Stacy and Meg and I'm like, hey, where are we? And so we kind of went back behind and there's this amazing, it opens up to this absolutely gorgeous, beautiful spot behind the apartments. And it was so fascinating to see. So I am so excited, even though I got to photograph it and talk a little bit about it, I am so excited to talk to Stacy more about uh, more of the uh, area and the history of Monroe Garden. So welcome Stacy. So happy to be here. Thanks so much for being here and getting to talk to us more about it. So uh, let's see, I'm going to make sure we've got you here and I'm going to bring up some of those pictures that we've got that we worked so hard on the other day. <laughs> and let's see. So first things first, let's, I would love to hear more about uh, how Monroe Gardens actually came to be. So what exactly is it that uh, was the beginning and formation of uh, Monroe Gardens? Well, absolutely. Um, I hope everyone will let me have uh, just 10 seconds before we launch into talking about the history of Monroe Gardens. Um, many years ago, I had the great pleasure of meeting William L. Monroe Sr.'s granddaughter, uh, Vicki Monroe Allen, and the reason I know so much about the history of Monroe Gardens and have great resources here at the Cherokee Garden Library of the Atlanta History Center is due to Vicki. Um, I think she might be on this um, program today watching. So if you're watching, Vicki, tremendous thanks to you for sharing your family photos with the collection here and helping us understand um, the importance of your family and your grandfather to the history of Atlanta. So, okay, now I'm ready to launch in. Um, so I think that's one of the closing slides. Can you go a little further up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. So, thanks. So William L. Monroe Sr. moved to Atlanta following his graduation from Elon College in Elon, North Carolina in 1918. And in 1925, amid a period where suburbs were being developed to the north and east all over Atlanta, um, he wisely purchased 15 acres on the north end of what was then Boulevard, now called Monroe Drive in his honor. And this was just at a time the city was expanding. And there he established two entities on the 15 acres. On part of the acreage, he established Monroe's Landscape and Nursery Company. And that was his business where he grew trees, shrubs, perennials, and annuals for his clients and had his employees, draftsmen, and also stonemasons and horticulturalists and others who could help um, put beautiful gardens at clients' homes, et cetera, around the city. And then adjacent to this, he built a home and beautiful garden for his family and also the community to come visit and that was called Monroe Gardens. And you'll see him pictured here um, with his wife, Isla. This is later in their lives. Um, they were big into square dancing and they started the Promenade Club in 
club here in Atlanta, and it's just great fun to see these early images. Um, later on, Monroe's son, also a landscape architect, um, joined this company after he graduated with his degree from the University of Georgia in 1948. And after Monroe Sr. died in 1963, his son operated the business until 1986. And interestingly, the grandson, William L. Monroe III, is today a practicing landscape architect here in Atlanta. And I love this image that's up right now. This is their two children, Evelyn and William Jr., who went by Billy and a friend of theirs. And this is at the wonderful fish pond that was at Monroe Gardens. And if you look in the background, you can see this fabulous rustic bridge, uh, very reminiscent of the arts and crafts movement there, and also the wonderful um, iris um, surrounding the children. I know I was looking through some of the pictures and I just thought that they were so of course as a photographer and being able to see some of these things but they also give us a beautiful insight into some of the other pieces within uh, the actual garden itself and walking around you see some of those remnants so seem to be like a pretty unique space. So would you be able to kind of talk a little bit more about um, how those unique traits were brought into the garden itself? Sure. So I think for our listeners, it's important to understand that Monroe had a degree in landscape architect. He was a very sophisticated gentleman, and he knew what was going on nationally. So his work, of course, was influenced by his own vision and interests, but also influenced by the rock garden movement that was going on nationally. Rock gardening was all the rage nationally in the 1920s and 30s throughout the country, and also the rustic and beautiful subtlety of the arts and crafts movement of that period. Now, this site had many, many fantastic features. Here you see um, Monroe Sr. and his beautiful wife Isla at the edge of the Great Lawn and just on, on the edge of that photograph you can see the Rock Chapel which was a very unique and special feature. In the foreground you can see the beautiful Rock Staircase and that was another part of the site. You saw in an earlier photo the fish pond. Um, the site also had a waterfall. Can you imagine walking out your door as a child and you have your own waterfall to go visit? It had a recreational lodge, which was sort of the heart of the center where people came together to dance and hold parties and they held weddings there. And there were wonderful picnic areas and much, much more on the property as well. Oh, here is um, his wife, Isla. If you look in the background of this image, you see the fallout shelter. So this was built in that time period when people were concerned um, during the Second World War, also the First World War coming after that, and wanting to have supplies and resources for the family. And I, I adore this image. You see the exquisite rock work on the wall that Isla is sitting on. And in the foreground, just in time for fall, you see all those um, beautiful pansies. I thought that some of like the traits in the garden were just so Fantastic. And it's also not necessarily like a traditional garden the way that you might think about it. So there's a lot of different pieces to it that uh, I think were so well planned as well. Um, can you, so can you talk about a little bit about some of like the the work that went into planning about the garden? Sure. I mean, one thing that really fascinates me about Monroe Sr. is he was a landscape architect and, you know, oversaw a nursery as well. He really wanted to work with the topography of the land. He wanted to work with the land. Um, let's think about uh, 21st century and how often developers go in and they denude the land and they try to flatten all the curves and, and hills. Well, Monroe was not working from that lens. He wanted to work with the land and he wanted to be naturalistic and bring his clients, his family, and others in the public because he worked on public parks as well closer to nature. So I think that really resonates to me today. We're in the pandemic and nature as always is important to us, but it's even become more important um, to our mental and um, emotional well-being. And Monroe understood that from the get-go um, when he started his practice. And so that's one thing that's really special about his work 
He really blended national movements together. He had some formal components, but also the rock gardening components and arts and crafts rustic components. And he also was a good plantsman. So his landscapes were layered with native trees and shrubs but also he used traditional Southern plants that we're very familiar with, like our non-native azaleas and camellias, et cetera. So it's really um, great to think about his vision and how much he understood the land and really wanted to bring that to the city of Atlanta. So as we're going through some of these pictures, kind of looking at the state of the gardens today, is it possible for folks to go and visit the gardens? Well, as we said earlier, it is actually on private property. There's some beautiful townhomes there, Ansley Monroe Villas, and so that is private. But I do know that the Piedmont Heights Civic Association from time to time does hold in-person walking tours. And when they do, um, you can go and enjoy this. And I'm hoping they'll be able to have some walking tours soon. Of course, during the pandemic, it's a little challenging. But as soon as they're able, I'm happy to go along with everyone and share what I love about this special place. And so talking about the national sort of scope of the gardens, how did the current sort of era reflect what uh, Monroe was bringing into the gardens at the time? Well, I, I've mentioned it a few times in the talk. I mean, he was really bringing these national garden movements at the time, rock gardening and arts and crafts movement to Atlanta. And I think it's really important to understand that William L. Monroe Sr. was really in that first generation of professionally trained landscape architects that helped shape the land in Atlanta. And it's mind boggling to think about this to me, but during his career, he designed over 10 thousand landscapes throughout Atlanta and the Southeast. So just get your mind around that for a minute, 10,000. And that was everything for private homeowners, uh, maybe like you and I, Sarah, um, all the way to really large commercial and public projects. He did university landscapes and he did two really important parks in Atlanta that are still extant and very important to the landscape of our city. One is Adams Park. I think you have a slide of it later in the slideshow. And this is in Southwest Atlanta. It's one of my favorite parks in the city. And he designed this in the mid 1930s. There it is. There's the wonderful Adams Park. If you haven't had a chance to go over there, I highly recommend it. And then the other park that he's most known for is Chastain Memorial Park in North Atlanta, which he designed components of in the late 1930s. And you all will all be familiar with that incredible amphitheater. And if you've walked around Chastain Park, you know the picnic shelters and you know the rock work and you know, um, of course, the witch's cave. Um, so really important sites um, throughout our city. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stacey, for sharing all of that information with us. And I'm sure there's like tons, tons, tons more <laughs> too. So we really appreciate you giving us like at least a slice of the knowledge so we know a little bit more about the, the park and uh, the gardens and other things that are surrounding us. Because one of the things that I think is been the coolest for me going through um, the, some of these different landmarks as y'all have been telling about them is that these are places that we constantly pass by all the time. So having a little bit more of an, an eye now to look at things and go, oh, that's that's the Monroe rock formations and like other things like that in the gardens, I think is just such a fun thing that now driving or walking through the neighborhood, I get to incorporate my daily life. So I so appreciate that. And thank you so much, Stacey. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And I um, hope everyone that lives in the neighborhood, when you're just out and about, or maybe even in your own backyard, look and see if you see some old stonework or some little remnant, because you may have a piece of Monroe Gardens and Landscape and Nursery Company right on your own property. And um, we really want to preserve as much of these remnants as we can, because as I explained in my little part of the talk, he was very significant for the city and we want to honor his legacy and also just the importance of gardens to our community. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Stacey.
So our second stop that we have coming up is one, again, kind of with the theme is that you have, I guarantee it, driven past, walked past, probably driven uh, at some point or another in your stay in Atlanta. It's the Round Bank off of uh, 13. So I even pulled up some of our uh, Google Maps location so you can see exactly what I'm talking about with no question whatsoever. Yeah, you've driven past it before. So we are here with Tom Little, who's going to help us understand and know a little bit more about this iconic location. And I'm sure you have as much curiosity about it as I do, <laughs> having gone past it so many times. So thank you so much for being here, Tom. So first things first, I want to know more about when was it created? So like around what year? And why did they decide to build it with such an interesting design? Well, I think your slides, thanks for getting those Google uh, street images. They're great. I think that that tells a good bit of the story. Um, I'll answer one, one question. It was built in uh, 1961 and it opened in 1962. And uh, the reason the site was selected, if you'll go back to that map briefly, yeah. um, you can see that when it was built, it was Highway 85, Interstate 85. Well, then they built a new I-85 and the secondary one that you call 16 or 35 or whatever it is, is right next to it. So it's even more prominent now than when it was constructed because there's actually two freeways going by it. But the site was selected because you could see it from the freeway and it was adjacent to rapidly developing suburban uh, businesses and homes. And um, go, if you go to those advertisements, yeah. thank you. Um, they really touted the fact that it was a round bank. It was, it was unique. And um, if you have ever driven in the area, if you've been to the corner of Monroe and Piedmont, you've seen a very traditional red brick branch bank. That's what everything was for a decade or two before this, including for the trust company. But this kind of broke the mold. It was very modern. Um, they, they, they built it in this style to uh, express the technological advancement of their banking services, and um, as I said before, it's very unusual for Atlanta. And they hired a high profile architectural firm whose key designer was Henry Hova. I'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute. Yeah, I think we want to know like some of the unique features that were inside and even outside the bank when it was made. Well, it's unique because it's round for one thing, um, but I think if you look at the exterior of the building a little bit closer, um, you can see some classical influences. It has arches, has paired windows. It's very symmetrical in, in layout and in design. Um, that style was called new formalism. Um, and this is one of the better remaining examples of new formalist architecture in Atlanta. New formalism, was borrowing things from classical architecture and reinterpreting them with contemporary materials. In this case, cast in place concrete and glazed brick on the exterior. One of the changes is that the darker color brick you see in the photographs was actually a blue gray brick originally. It's been painted over um, since then. It was much more striking when it was new and the round bank tended to float more then. Um, the three pods serve automobile traffic with bank tellers. And one of the cool things about those pods is that you actually would go down to the basement of the round bank and walk through a tunnel to those pods. And if you were a teller, you would climb up a spiral staircase to get to those. Um, and they had a pneumatic tube system, which we take for granted and drive up banks now. But again, that was very technologically advanced for the time when this bank opened. Um, and if you look at the interior of the building, um, it was a very almost sparse by today's standards design, um, carpeting, uh, wood paneling, and it had two key features in the, in the space that don't exist anymore. There was a big round uh, wood clad form for the vault 
And then there was a smaller egg-shaped uh, circular piece for um, a conference room and the president's office. Um, if you'll go back a couple of slides, you can see the plan here. The round thing is the vault. The egg-shaped thing is the conference room and office. Um, you can see the ceiling here has recessed lights and uh, acoustical panels. Those remain, and, and we'll, we'll look at those slides. I see someone's asking whether that's a Cholulu piece or not. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and uh, if you'll go to the next uh, image, if they're in order, there you go. This shows the banking hall when it was basically brand new. Um, pretty streamlined, pretty uh, toned down by today's standards. Lots of modern furniture, very little that you would call traditional in this space. So cool. I love, the, again, like as a photographer, these I absolutely adore these older images in like the dot matrix printing to get to see what the transformation was and then how it stands today. But looking at all of those pieces, how, again, kind of like with that national perspective, what was happening around the time and the era that influenced the creation of the bank? Well, I'll talk about that. First, I'll, I'll frame that by starting off by talking about Henry Hoba a little bit. Um, he uh, graduated from Cornell in 1949 with an architectural degree, studied in Rome and came back to New York City to work in the Harrison and uh, Ab Abramovitz office, who were the firms responsible for Rockefeller Center and United Nations building and parts of Lincoln Center in New York City. He came to Atlanta shortly after that. He didn't like the big city quite so much. Worked at Abreu and Robeson's office in Atlanta, became their chief of design. And then in 1966, you see this image of the three guys here. Henry Hova is um, in this picture, and so is Stanley Daniels. Hova Daniels Busby, uh, John Busby's in the picture. That firm that they formed in 66 would come be responsible for Colony Square, the, some Marta stations, and the Carter Center. So he brought that national view to Atlanta and brought something new to the design of this bank. He passed away in 2014. The other picture is of him actually in the bank about 2004, 2005, when it had been converted to Pi Bar. So, I have a series of slides here that show some national context of round buildings. I won't dwell on them very long, but they're high profile. The Guggenheim Museum, which is at Central Park in New York, was completed in 1959 and was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. The next slide is the MIT Chapel in Boston, another round bank. This happens to be a, a chapel completed in 1955. If you go to the next slide, there's a donut shaped building in Washington on the mall um, that is the Hirshhorn Sculpture Garden. The design of this was actually uh, developed in the 1960s. It didn't open until 1974. Next slide. And then we come to some more regional examples of uh, bank architecture and round architecture. This is kind of a space age, atomic age bank that's in Alma, Georgia. And if you'll notice the sign, it's reminiscent of the sign that's actually at the Trust Company Bank. Again, there's some color here. There's also some glazed brick on this design, I believe as well. But you can almost see uh, electrons flying around this bank with the, the, the things going on here. Go to the next slide. Uh, in Meridian, Mississippi, which I spent a good bit of my childhood in, there were two round banks built at about the same time as the Trust Company Bank within two blocks of each other by two competing banks. Uh, they, they were all over the Southeast. Go to the next slide. And then the Decatur High School was completed in 1965 by Bothwell and Nash. They designed uh, other local landmarks. In Decatur, they were known for the Sherian uh, Rug Company that you've passed probably a million times if you're familiar with Decatur. Next slide. 
And another high style building here in Atlanta is the Alexander Pound residence, which is in Buckhead. And um, it was completed in 1957, designed by Cecil Alexander and Fabwrap, and it's been restored and is on the National Register now. Next slide. There was a house uh, built in Collier Heights, not sure of the date or the architect or whether there was an architect involved, but you can see that the influence of these round buildings was everywhere. This is likely to have been built in the late 50s through the mid 60s at some point. Next slide. The other uh, CNS, one of their competitors to Trust Company uh, was the CNS Bank. Um, and they built this amazing tower in Midtown, which is right behind what I call the Bank of America Tower, but I, I'm assuming you may have known it as the Nation's Bank Tower. Um, you can see the Fox Theater in the background. Um, this was on a pedestal, not unlike Henry Hovis, much smaller um, round bank that we're talking about. It was demolished in 1993 after being completed in 1967. Go to the next slide. And then perhaps the most remarkable round bank that was ever built in Atlanta was the CNS Moreland branch. Not a new formalist because there's no interpretation of classical elements here but it was round and stepped around a pond in the middle of it. Uh, designed by Kenneth Johnson, uh, it, it was finished in 1969 and demolished in 2011, which brings us back to the Trust Company Bank um, that we're talking about. The next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and you ask why we might want to preserve this bank. And um, I think one of the reasons is evidenced by the last two slides. It's one of the survivors. It's one of the best remaining examples of this type of architecture in this period of architecture in Atlanta. And it was designed by one of the key movers in Atlanta architecture, Henry Hoba. Yeah, and interestingly enough, for uh, some of us that have lived in Atlanta for um, a while, but might not have even known, the bank was actually um, in danger of being demolished at one point. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about the efforts to preserve it and get it on the historic National Register? Sure, sure. It was um, actually two, it, two times in the 2000s, it's been at risk for demolition. The first time was after the bank closed in 2002, it sat vacant for several years. Um, we thought the bank had been saved when Pi Bar opened up in 2004 to 2005. And here's some slides that were taken when Pi Bar opened at that time. Um, it was uh, a, a, a sensitive renovation of the building. It preserved the interior space. And um, we thought it was saved. In fact, in the next slide, there is a picture of a fundraiser we had at that time that was co-sponsored by the Preservation Center, which we're going to hear more about in a minute, and Okamomo, Georgia. Um, and we had a really good turnout for that. We got to eat gourmet pizza and drink exotic cocktails. It was a lot of fun. Um, but you can see the interior preserved uh, basically the essentials of the building. And it certainly preserved the essentials on the exterior. Um, so we thought it was saved, but Pi Bar didn't last very long. And there was a series of restaurants that were occupying the space until the current uh, occupant called Cirque moved in, who have um, seemed to identify to, uh, their uh, audience and have been successful. They're busy all the time. We go to the next slide. And then in 2016, even with CERC occupying building and paying rent, a proposal to tear the bank down and to build a uh, storage unit building came about. This is a picture of what was gonna replace the bank or what had been proposed to replace the bank. And uh, it was presented to the, the Beltline uh, Design Review Com Commission Committee 
And uh, they had sort of approved this with some conditions and they were about to come back and present a revised design when it came to the uh, attention of the Preservation Center in Docomomo, Georgia, that had, it had already been identified for preservation in the Beltline Master Plan. So that led to uh, what happened next. And I thought it might be good for David to talk a little bit about the uh, easements and how the, the, the bank was saved in 2016. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate all the knowledge that you've brought to understanding and seeing something that, again, like we just pass by every day, but maybe we don't know this extensive history about it um, and that it was even at some point in danger of being demolish, which at least for me, like I can't imagine driving down that corridor of the freeway and not seeing that bank. So let's talk to David a little bit about what it has, the preservation efforts um, when it comes to saving not only the bank, but other parts of Atlanta and its historic nature too. All right, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yes. That's right. I think I fixed everything. So I pre thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom, for that little intro. And I also want to let everyone know who participating in this that I appreciate their kind of standing on pins and needles for me to get in here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm David Yoki Mitchell. I'm the executive director um, of the Atlanta Preservation Center. And I'm, you know, kind of leading up what Tom was talking about. You think something's saved, you think th something is taken care of, only to find out sometimes it isn't. Um, what the Atlanta Preservation Center and Ducamoma did, and then along with Easements Atlanta, was really make sure that this bank exists for future generations. And what this kind of leads into is also a discussion um, about what Piedmont Heights is, um, because I think it's very important to realize one thing, um, Bangkok, which is the oldest Thai restaurant in the city of Atlanta, is in Piedmont Heights. Um, it is a phenomenal place to eat. If you haven't been there, you should go there. Um, I guess the thing I want to launch into is some of these images that are kind of launched across the screen. What you have right here is a place called Peg Leg Studio. Um, it's over there um, going on the West End. It's down right there with Abernathy. And what you're looking at is where egg crates used to slide down in that little gap in the hole. And okay, I'm just saying we cannot see the speaker. Is this better? It should be fine because we're able okay. to see like the slides and everything. I'd rather see the slides. Okay, okay. Forgive I love me, you, David. But <laughs> <laughs> Look, and this is another image um, of Picnic Studio, and this is the, the bottom area. This used to be when the rails, uh, the railroads were going straight to the front of buildings. This was an area that would have opened up to a fed, uh, materials going in and out of Atlanta. Um, the reason I'm kind of just launching in this and just kind of hitting it this way is Atlanta has so much more and so diverse. And to see the materials that you're seeing from Piedmont Heights, from the Rock Garden, to the, the Round Bank, to seeing these things, you really realize that we are a very unique American city. Um, this is Burden's Barbershop. This is off Hilliard, off Auburn Avenue. That's Mr. Johnson. The individual you see right there used to cut Muhammad Ali's hair. Um, a phenomenal individual and does a great deal of stewardship for his community by assisting with people who have challenges with various um, cultural and social issues by making sure that everyone has a good haircut, a uh, microwave to use to warm up for breakfast, and provides orange juice for a number of different people um, who come in and out of that shop between seven and nine in the morning. That's um, really one of the most unique creatures that I get to um, spend time with in the city of Atlanta. Um, worked at the Silver Moon at one point, and knowledge of Auburn Avenue down to Jinky Steakhouse is just fabulous. Um, so um, is there another slide or I'll just yeah. keep going from there? All right. And then of course, one of my favorite places in the whole world, Westview Cemetery, where I will also reside when I am no longer breathing. And it is, that, is the, that is one of the older structures in the city of Atlanta, it's the gatehouse, 1884. The bell that is in there still rings and was made by the same company that built the Liberty, that made the Liberty Bell. Um, just a phenomenal, phenomenal resource, and we are working with them through the Friends of Historic Westview, the Atlanta Preservation Center, and uh, to get the kitchen. So we are hoping in the next two years to have that be activated to have places where one can use the restroom um, and also get information about Westview, the history of Atlanta, and the West End as a whole. Um, is there another slide? Yeah. 
And this is the Abrams building that Braden Film is currently working with um, off Abernathy, going on the former Stewart Avenue, now Metropolitan Parkway. And this shows you the kind of the breezeway, but it goes to show you also that the, these windows were once blocked up and that will potentially be either opened, act, reactivated, and so forth. And you see kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. That's a lot of what preservation provides. This is a huge deal. Um, preservation is probably the greatest form of communication that people have, that particularly have a struggle communicating to one another through the common tongue. When you get to use spaces in order to create a third tier for people to feel invited to participate, communicate, and begin to understand and unravel their identities, their cultures, and their purposes, all of a sudden an old wall, an old building, an old space becomes new and a uh, a common ground for so many different people to meet together and to start to discuss the various um, complexities that we face each day. We at the Atlanta Preservation Center are expanding through a great deal of effort, particularly with the inclusion of social media, um, the way that we now interact with smartphones. Um, the fact that I'm using mine right now to communicate is an example that, you know, we're all having to evolve. And how we evolve in these spaces also speaks very, very, very highly of who and what we are as a city. Um, what Stacy brought in the first part with Rock Gardens, talking about the fact that the individual did over 10,000 gardens and landscapes and so forth. And that when you could be walking through and around the city of Atlanta, you may stare at a rock that at one point in time was somewhere else. That's a very unique approach to preservation. Um, Tom talking about all the various things, uh, various banks, the type, the style, the period and the fact that one was behind uh, the Fox Theater removed in 93, you know, now that becomes a gap in time when you remember. And so how we choose to use preservation, engage with memory is massively important. So really to kind of go into this thing a little bit further is what Piedmont Heights has put on, Meg and Sarah, is a real opportunity for everyone attending this meeting today to understand that preservation is really going to be the key ingredient moving forward to how society and culture is gonna be pinned together in order to find some sort of civility to participate in our experience. Atlanta continues to evolve, change, and alter its positions and its feelings, yet it's consistently rooted in a um, narrative of trying. And sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's hard, but if you see the group of people who are here today, Saturday is a unique time for everybody to get together, but the fact we have this many people to grouped together speaks volumes to the fact that preservation matters. And I think more than anything else, um, if you think about Piedmont Heights, and you think about this, this neighborhood and the way this thing has been pulled together, all of a sudden you have Smith's Old Bar, you have Bangkok. But then again, you know, we mentioned we were having our little warm-up aspect of this, is there was Cow Tippers was once there. And Cow Tippers was a great place to get a steak. It was also a phenomenal place to feel very comfortable and very welcomed. And, you know, if you had a long week and to go somewhere and to see a smile and then have someone say, you know, well done or rare was a good laugh. And I think it's very, very, very important for people to understand that it's preservation that allows so much of this to happen. And we're very grateful to be able to have so many different partners from Stacey Atlanta History Center, from Tom and Docomomo from you know easements atlanta which for 34 years has been creating a level of stewardship and participation and protection that really would not exist we have over 40 properties and easements uh tom has participated in it stacy participated in it. i participated in it um people watching this right now participate in it and that's to me is another example of the fact that we're willing to ensure the fact that preservation um, exists long after we're gone and that we send messages to the future through our structures, through the spaces, through the um, narratives that we, that we fight for so that those who come behind us know who and what we were a little bit and hopefully do a better job. How's that? That's fantastic. And I can see everyone on the panel nodding very vigorously in agreement <laughs> as well. So awesome. I'm very, I'm very sick when I didn't screw it up. No, it's, really, <laughs> it's a really big deal. It's a really big deal. And yeah. I think everybody watching needs to be really proud of themselves. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. Now we want to switch gears a little bit and we're going to open it up to some Q&A. So I'm going to 
spotlight the wonderful Meg Anderson from the Piedmont Heights Civic Association. And if you have any questions uh, from our audience, Yes, I do. And before I um, talk about some of the questions that we've gotten, although thank, thank you to everyone, some of the questions have been answered along the way. So um, I wanted to say thank you again to Vicki um, Monroe Allen for being here and inviting so many people that graduated with her um, from Grady High School. Yeah, you know, y'all really grew up just you know, just over in Morningside or even in Piedmont Heights as well. So it's a great group to have, um, you know, to be able to join us on this virtual tour. And um, also I see Miss Bibi Cheshire and um, Miss Anita Brown. They are so active in what used to be the Rock Spring Presbyterian Church, um, which recently closed. You know, speaking of preservation, the building um, is protected and is in the process of trying to be purchased um, by a local school that's trying to expand, you know, which is such a great example of a, a preservation opportunity here in Piedmont Heights that we're so proud is happening um, and just fingers crossed that everything goes through, um, you know, quickly and efficiently and all that good stuff. But, um, and, but then the Rock Spring Cemetery is also right there with, you know, all the names you see on streets around Atlanta, like like Cheshire, the Cheshires of Cheshire Bridge Road and the Fars and, you know, all these names that you see all over town. Um, and that cemetery is just a wonderful, beautiful example of preservation that that is, um, you know, just such a great example of being well kept and you know, it, it's alive with with so many great stories if you stop by. So so thank you to everyone for for doing, um, keeping the cemetery up to date and the church looking beautiful. All right, there was a question for Stacy. Um, you know, we've talked about the Trust Company Bank building being such a great example of a, a success story of preservation. Do you know of any plans in the works with Monroe Gardens? Like, as we've mentioned, it's owned by the Ansley Monroe Villa townhome community. Um, you know, we, we'd love to start some type of conversation with them. I didn't know if you knew of any plans about preservation uh, for Monroe Gardens and the remnants in the neighborhood. Um, the only discussions I've been involved with, I have spoken to a few individuals at the Atlanta Beltline in hopes to get some signage on the edge of the Beltline, um, talking about the importance of the history of the site and Mr. Monroe. Um, but really, this is a call out to the Neighborhood Association and the Piedmont Heights Civic Association Foundation um, to hopefully come together with the Atlanta Preservation Center. Sorry to put you on the spot there, David and also Youth <laughs> Miss Atlanta potentially to work with um, the townhome community. It's a fabulous place and I've been so fortunate to visit it a few times um, to protect um, what remains and hopefully stabilize and restore uh, the walls and the structures that still exist there so that future generations can understand um, how important this site was to our city. Absolutely. Um, let's see, we have a question. You don't know when those condos were built, or not condos, the townhomes, um, by any chance, do you? They, I, I don't off the top of my head. They came in, in the 80s. Um, okay. I have it in my notes. I don't have them right in front of me, but um, I'm sure some of the people in the audience know exactly the date, but I believe it was in the mid-1980s. Okay. Yeah, I know we have um, at least one person from the townhomes on the, on the presentation today. Um, James Locke is here. Thank you for joining us. Um, let's see, and Vicki Allen had a question um, about, let me find it here. Uh, do you, she says, do you want to talk about uh, Burford Holly and the landscaping? Oh, I'm not quite sure what Vicki's asking, but um, her grandfather did have signature plants that he used in a lot of his gardens, and this may be what she's alluding to. If not, type, type in and let us know, Vicki. Um, but he did use a lot of native plants and, you know, there's a huge uh, resurgence and move back to natives now. But he also used a lot of southern well-known plants and the Burford Eye Holly or Burford Holly um, was one of them. And she may have um, brought that up because, of course, that plant was sort of found by Thomas Burford at Westview Cemetery, uh, which David um, mentioned in his part of the program. And so there are always these wonderful connections between sites and you often find them through plants. So um, all us plant geeks out there just love to think about where a plant was, you know, scooped up and then how it was disseminated throughout this, the city. But Monroe Senior definitely used 
um, that and a lot of his designs. Um, and just really his knowledge of being a great plantsman in addition to a landscape architect to me um, speaks a lot about his importance and how he was able to shape these gardens and make them very beautiful for the city. Awesome. All right, we've got a question for David here. Um, where is the Preservation Center located and how can people get involved with saving more of Atlanta's his historic spaces? This is, a, this is a gimme. This is a lot of fun. All right, it is located at 327 St. Paul. It is the home, uh, it was the, it's the home, former home of Lemuel Pratt Grant and Laura Loomis Williams Grant. Um, it is now the oldest house still standing in the city of Atlanta. It was built in 1856. Um, and I am speaking to you from it right now. Um, one, you can always, there's nothing greater. The greatest nation in the whole world is donation. And so joining the Atlanta Preservation Center allows us to do a great deal of advocacy and outreach and education. So that is a fundamental way to assist in the process of preservation. But I also too was remiss, um, when I was showing the Abrams building at the very end, um, Tom's architectural firm he's associated with is actually the one involved with that. So it's very important to also realize um, in this process, the way you can help do preservation is be proactive and do things. Picking up trash is preservation. Being nice to people is preservation. Um, helping someone do something in their yard is preservation. You don't have to always think of things in the very large scheme. Sometimes you can think small and that way you can build upon it, which is a great component of the narrative of preservation. You have to start somewhere. So. Um, one, joining our organization is always a great way. It makes me very happy. But the other thing about it is, is that go to Piedmont Heights and eat. Go over there and spend time, do things. Go to look at gardens and think of Stacy and say something nice. Um, go to unique um, spaces like the Round Bank and say thank you, Tom. Things like that make a big difference. And I think that's the way I would start. That's a great point. I think, you know, supporting our local businesses during the, the pandemic is really important to make sure that, that they stay open, and not just the structures, but the businesses that are helping this community that. thrive. Absolutely. And, you know, we have Gotham Way Park here in Piedmont Heights that I believe the land was donated in the 50s um, from Stein Printing Company, which is ironic because I used to work at Stein Printing Company in uh, in college and right after college. So it, it was like I came full circle from working somewhere that now I live in the place where they donated our local park and, and we own that park. So that's something that, you know, if you ever make a donation to the Piedmont Heights Foundation, that goes a long way to helping, um, you know, buy new playground equipment, keep it mowed and looking fabulous. So, you know, things like that are a great way to help preserve um, our, our tiny little slice of Atlanta. You know, we call, we call Pi High our small town in the big city. So every little bit helps. It most certainly does. And I feel, I feel compelled real quick to say, my aunt and uncle in West Palm Beach, Florida are on this call as well. So thank you very much, Mary and John. <laughs> All right, we've got one more question. How about let's take these final two um, questions and then we'll wrap it up. Let's see, these are for Tom. Uh, the, the bank now, or the bank building is now Cirque Daiquiri Bar. And the question is the chandelier that looks like a Dale Chihuly piece. Tom, do you know who designed that beautiful chandelier that you had in your slides? And you're on mute, by the way. Am I unmuted? I guess I am. You, can you hear me? We can okay. hear you. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it is a Cholule piece, but it's certainly in the style of Cholule. Um, and I think that came about as part of uh, Cirque's occupancy. I don't think that was installed during the pie bar renovations, so. I can't give a definitive answer on that. If you like daiquiris, you go by there and have a daiquiri and take a look and probably ask the manager and they might know, so. I have the email address for the owner. I'll, I'll see if she can find out and I'll, I'll post it on our website. We had Tokomomo uh, actually got together for cocktails at Cirque. Uh, two or three years ago, and um, it was fun. The manager came over and was thrilled that we were there. So um, the music is quite loud, I will say that, so. <laughs> awesome, all right, well, I'm gonna hand it back over to Sarah. 
All right. Well, thank you so much again, everyone, not only our amazing panelists today for coming and sharing your knowledge, um, but everyone that showed up today. So as David was talking about, just you showing up helps to get us involved in these preservation efforts around the city of Atlanta. Um, if there's more that you want to do and you want to stay involved, uh, check out some of the websites that we were mentioning. There's plenty of stuff going on consistently. There's a virtual walking tour of Piedmont Heights on the Piedmont Heights Civic Association website. Uh, you get to learn more about it. Uh, Meg was talking about Gotham Way Park. That's a beautiful spot to go and hang out. The Atlanta Preservation Center is things going on consistently, especially with the Atlanta History Center as well, and Doko Momo. So all of those places are ways that you can stay involved in the, these preservation efforts around uh, Piedmont Heights and the city of Atlanta. So we really appreciate, appreciate y'all coming out. Uh, don't forget to head over. If you really liked what you saw today, donate. Yeah, go so head over to the Piedmont Heights Civic Association uh, and make sure to donate and we'll keep these uh, talks going and come up. We have, we literally have a huge list of places that we would love to continue doing these virtual talks that Meg and I have kind of gone back and forth and said, oh, this would be so cool. And I want to go out and take more pictures of them. So give me an excuse to continue to take really cool pictures. So we appreciate, again, thank you so much for everyone. Thank you to the Piedmont Heights Civic Association, and we will see you next time. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.